I am reacting to one of my conditions as represented on Grey's Anatomy. Stick around to see what I think. Hello, my name is Alyssa Lane and welcome to my channel where I share all about my chronic illness journey to help educate and support others. And today I am reacting to episode 5 of season 15 of Grey's Anatomy called Everyday Angels. Now in this episode there is a patient who gets diagnosed with MAUS, which is Median Arcuate Ligament Syndrome. Now if you don't know what that is or you want to learn more about the condition, you can watch my video linked up here and also down in the description box below this video. One last thing before we get started watching is that I have seen this episode before. I saw it once when it first aired. So this is not a totally blind reaction, but it's, I haven't seen it since then. So there's probably still a lot to unearth here. Ah, here we are. <laughs> Ms. Sullivan. Hey, I'm Dr. Bailey. This is Dr. Wilson. Karev. Karev. I'm here for Dr. Gray. Yes, Dr. Gray is unavailable, so we are going to be the wasting your time. All right. I've already seen an internist, two gastroenterologists, and two surgeons who ran dozens of inconclusive tests before diagnosing me with acid reflux, anorexia, and anxiety, none of which are actually the cause of my stomach pain. So I'm here to see the woman I read about the best, Dr. Meredith Gray, and you have both made it clear that you are not her. So no thank you and goodbye. Okay, so some thoughts right off the bat. I love the binder. I have a binder. Hers is a bit prettier with blue and like fresh tabs. Mine's old and black and kind of falling apart. But if you are struggling for a diagnosis and you're hopping from doctor to doctor, carrying around a binder with your medical records is a great idea because it's so much easier to say something. The doctor goes, well, we'll have to ask for the records. And you can go, no, here they are. Here's what happened last time. Here are my test results if you want to read them as well. So like A plus there. Her talking about like the number of physicians she has seen totally lines up. I saw quite a few physicians before I got my diagnosis, but I didn't see quite as many, but I think that's because I was super fortunate. A lot of people with MALS see a lot of doctors who do diagnose them with things like acid reflux, anxiety, and anorexia. All of those were thrown around. I was diagnosed with acid reflux and told, well here, Take this antacid for six months and come back if it's not any better at that point. Which is crazy and clearly was not the cause of my pain. So like this totally lines up with my experience for sure. Okay. Ms. Sullivan, I'm not Meredith Grey, this is true. But I am the woman who taught Meredith Grey. Yes, she Grey is. was a lump of clay when I met her, and I shaped her with my two hands into the surgeon that she's become. And I helped her with the mini livers. The HIDA scan and the ERCP were negative. Which rules out the gallbladder and biliary tree. Hey, yeah, I told you that a half hour ago. OK, we know that, but this is how we work. <sighs> yeah, yeah, process of elimination, I get it. We do the same thing down at my auto shop. I'm a mechanic, and I learned everything I know from my dad. He ran that shop for 45 years, then retired and passed it on to me. Along with that lunch pail. Oh, which you brought for good luck? Which you brought with me for lunch. Constantly fasting for all the tests you doctors order, so I bring myself a sandwich for when I'm done. Um, so, uh, definitely had a HIDA scan. I'm not sure if I've had an ERCP. I'd have to look up. But I talked about my HIDA scan in my gallbladder removal video. And I think I mentioned at the end of that video that while I did have my gallbladder out, Retrospectively, I'm pretty sure that the pain I was having then was mouse pain, but the gallbladder surgery was important. I probably would have needed to have had it out anyway, and it bought me quite a lot of time. So if you want to learn more about my gallbladder removal, again, I'll have it linked up in the corner and down in the description box. I want to run a technetium scan to rule out Meckel's diverticulum. It's not that. You've been tested? No. But I've read about it online. Okay, the internet does not provide accurate diagnoses. Yeah, well, as far as I can tell, neither do you. Fair point. I am all about doing research on the internet, obviously. I'm here making videos to help your research on the internet. But one of the reasons I think that we got me diagnosed with MALS so fast was because we heard a talk about it on the internet before I got sick. And my mom sort of, she was the one who watched it, and she sort of went, huh, that sounds a lot like the pain Alyssa had back in the eighth grade. Weird. And just sort of filed it away in the back of her head. 
But then when we sort of hit our first dead end and looking for Mal's answers, she remembered that, that video that she watched and we did a lot more research on Mal's itself and, and made efforts to see physicians who knew about Mal's and who would actually test me for it. So by all means, do not be afraid of internet research. I think it is so important, especially with super duper rare conditions like Mal's that most physicians have never even heard of. Unfortunately, we've exhausted every test that we can think of. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I understand. But I don't accept. I don't accept your failure to diagnose me, and I won't accept discharge papers either. So I'm going to eat my sandwich, and you're going to go remember that you are the teacher of Meredith Gray. Uh -huh. Nina, we've run out of tests. Find new tests. Invent them. Take care of me. That is your job. It's my page psych. I can't keep living like this. I can't keep being told it's in my head when I know that it's not. I can't keep being told that I'm crazy when I'm not crazy. If you don't help me, I'm going to kill myself. And then all those doctors who said it was in my head will be right. But they're not right. I know there is something wrong with me. Nina? OK. <laughs> What is it? What is it? Here? Okay, thoughts? Makes me want to cry a little bit, even now. Like, oh man. One of the things that I think was really nice about that is that Bailey and Joe are really sincere in their apologies. When I have been sort of brushed off by doctors before, they are never sorry. It's like, well, clearly you don't actually have a problem, so go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist because it must be in your head. I have 100% been told that more than once in my life, and it is devastating. It's, it's devastating being told that it's in your head when it's not. When you know that there is something physically wrong and they just say, well, Sorry about you because I don't know the answer. It must not exist. Like that is so, so upsetting. And while I've never been suicidal, I can totally see how you can be pushed to that brink. Because mouse pain is excruciating. To be in that pain all the time already puts you in like a not so healthy mental place. But to then be repeatedly told that you're making it up or that it's in your head, that it's not real, that it's not physically real, I could easily see how that could push someone over the edge into becoming suicidal, which is so sad and definitely the reality for a lot of people. And I have to wonder how many people have been there in the past because Mal's is so rare. And even as rare as it is, it's only been recently that it's been well talked about. It's only been recently that patients have had the ability to search the internet and look for other testimonials and find answers and have surgeons talking about what kind of surgeries will help and what they can do when we now have consistent tests that we can do to test for mouse. Despite, you know, maybe the tests not being perfect, the fact that we have them is leaps and bounds ahead of we were a few decades ago. And I have to wonder, you know, before that time, how many patients suffered for the rest of their lives and took their suffering to new ends or were locked in psychiatric facilities without being actually treated for their pain and being told that they're making the pain up or that they're anorexic, that it's their fault, it's their mind telling them they don't want to eat, it's not actually pain preventing them from eating. So like that just first and foremost, ugh, pulls in my heartstrings. A few critiques. I think the makeup on the patient is a little severe. I mean, the paleness, sure, fine. I mean, I probably have a pretty similar complexion to her. So, like, I was definitely pale the whole time. But my eyes were never that red. 
Like that's not a thing I've seen before in real life. I've never seen anybody with eyes that sunken and red and angry. Even in myself, if I've been crying, my eyes don't look like that. So that might be a little on like the extra dramatic side. Don't expect your family members to have eyes that look like that if they have mouths. And don't expect that of yourself either because that's just not, not the way it works. Um, also, my attacks never came on that quickly. I'd probably have 30 minutes from like the time that I started eating to when the pain first started. And for me, I mean, it was, it was like a gradual ramping up of pain. It wasn't zero to 60 that we went pretty quickly to full blown pain, but it was not that fast a few seconds into eating. And also she like grabbed her stomach initially really low and I know other people have had mouse pain in different areas, but like for me, my pain was always right here. Midline, just under my sternum, right under my ribs. The pain was consistently right there all the time. I also had nausea early on, but then not as much later on. And I don't think they've talked about nausea, but that is also a really common symptom of mouse. So just like keep that in mind, but I'm, really resonating with the emotional core of this story, that that is so important and I think very realistic. Oh, it hurts. Oh, no, just try to relax, okay? Do you hear something? A swooshing sound? Like her sandwich digesting? Well, like a vascular brewery. Um, oh. Here, let's try the ultrasound. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And to the right. Yeah. I'm gonna press. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, take a deep breath for me. And exhale. There. Oh, the median arcuate ligament. You've got mouths. Whoa. I've only read about this. A, a ligament is wrapped tightly around your celiac artery. It expands when you eat. You know, no one's found it because you always fast before your visits. We can go in laparoscopically, cut it. Takes 20 minutes. I knew it was real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a real thing. And we found it. Mm -hmm. And Meredith Gray did not. Okay, again, making me cry a little bit here. I think just because it resonates so much. So let's, so let's talk about the science of it. Um, you can absolutely hear the brewing, 100%. I've done it on myself. We have a stethoscope at home. You can get them. I don't think they're very expensive. And you can listen to yourself. Put the stethoscope in your ears. Listen midline. And when you exhale, you're going to hear an extra swoosh sound when you have mouse. And you could listen before you eat and after you eat to sort of get those reference points. But the reason that happens is because when you breathe in and out, your diaphragm is at different levels because it's the muscle that causes you to breathe. And so when it's in the right position, when you exhale, it causes the uh, hole to get smaller uh, around your celiac artery and you're hearing the blood struggling to get through that much smaller hole than it's used to having to go through. So that's why you hear the brewy. And one of the initial tests for mouths is using a sonogram or an ultrasound. And you can, they can see how hard the blood is having to work to get through that artery. And so they'll have you do it inhaling, exhaling, holding your breath, exhaling, maybe a different position from lying down to sitting up to standing even. And then after that, they usually do a CTA to confirm, so that is a CT angiogram. So they'll do it with contrast and it'll help them visualize that ligament better. I actually always kind of avoided that mistake that she had about always showing up fasting for her visits. If I wasn't told to fast, I would almost try to induce symptoms in myself by eating that morning. Just because I was trying to combat that very big fear of not being believed. So I always felt that if I presented in the most severe case that I experienced, then I was more likely to be believed and it would be easier to test for. I'm not saying you should make yourself miserable before you go to the doctors, 
but that was something definitely that I did. I don't know that it helped or that it hurt, but it was something that I always did as a precaution. Because if you've seen that gallbladder video I talked about earlier, I have had this fear of not being believed by physicians or really by anyone for a long time. So that's, I think, where that comes from. Also, there are questions now about how good laparoscopic procedures are for mouse. My first mouse surgery was a lap procedure. So I had it done, it failed for me, but that doesn't mean it fails for everyone. That is certainly not the case. It works well for a lot of people. And it bought me like 20 months without pain from my lap procedure, which I think was definitely worth it. And I was, I'm still happy with our decision to sort of be more conservative in our approach, starting with the lap and then moving up to the open as I needed it. But I do know that there is some discussion in the mouse community about whether or not laps really have that high of a success rate. So that's just something to keep in mind for yourself personally. This was several years ago, so I don't think that conversation had ever really happened before. So just, you know, something to keep in mind if you're thinking about having surgery for your mouths. Okay, so that wraps up Nina's storyline. That's all the content there is there. And some final thoughts. I think they did an excellent job of capturing the emotional side of the story about what it feels like and what it does to a person to have this debilitating pain and experience and to go to their doctor and say, hey, I'm in this excruciating pain. It's debilitating. I can't live my life with it what do we do about it? And to be told time and time again after saying that, well, no, I didn't find anything, so nothing must exist. I'll shuffle you along to the next person. I think they got that emotional core and just the feelings of finally having an answer, the relief on her face is absolutely what it feels like to be told, yes, it is real. And even better, it's something we can fix, which is just, uh, it's the best, it's the best feeling in the world. If you haven't experienced it yet yourself, I really hope and pray that someday you will get to experience the elation that comes with hearing that. It, it is easily the best emotion and moment I've ever had. So I think Grey's Anatomy did a really great job. And more than that, I'm so thankful for them for bringing awareness about this condition. I have seen people in one of the biggest Mal's Facebook page called Mal's Pals, which I'll link down in the description box if you're not already a part of it. But I've seen people there talk about the fact that they learned for the first time about mouths from watching this episode and then were able to take it to their doctor, get diagnosed, and get treated all because of Grey's Anatomy. And I am so thankful to the writers and the producers and the actors and everyone else involved for taking this story and presenting it in such a way that it can help real people. And it's also a great touchstone for me when I've talked to people before, right, when it happened when they... Some of my friends said, oh, you know, I watched Grey's Anatomy last night. Is that the thing that you had surgery for? And I can say yes. And you can start to see maybe they get a little more understanding. So I also think it's a great tool for that as well. And I think those are all of my thoughts on this episode. I, I really enjoyed it. I liked coming back and seeing the characters from a few seasons ago and see where some of those dramatic storylines have come and changed. But if you liked this Reacts video, be sure to like this video. And if there's another episode that has to do with chronic illness of a TV show that you want me to check out, be sure to leave it for me down in the comment section below. I really enjoyed this and I would definitely be interested in doing another one and have some plans maybe to do a few more. But if you have suggestions, let me know about them down in the comment section below. Also, if you want to hear more about my personal mouse story, then you're in luck because I am making a video about that this month. So you should definitely consider subscribing by clicking that subscribe button if you haven't already so that YouTube knows that you want to see this video from me when it comes out. And I am looking forward to seeing you all very soon with another video. Bye.